the Gulf of Mexico, terminus of America's mightiest river, incomparable cradle of life, drawing millions of migrating birds, and the nation's greatest nursery of fish. Yet after decades of neglect, the Gulf has come to symbolize loss. Twice, it has recently served as bullseye for the costliest hurricane and the largest oil spill in U.S. history. Its longer history describes a more insidious decay, its wetlands vanishing by the minute, its water seasonally rendered dead for lack of oxygen. The insults to the Gulf come from all quarters. Dredges and channels have diverted the mighty and muddy Mississippi away from the wetlands they once nourished. A gauntlet of industries and cities lining the river's banks have discharged their pollutants, destroying the marsh's seafood nurseries, expanding the dead zone to record size. But just as there are many to blame for the demise of America's greatest coastal wetland, so too there are many rescues now underway to reverse it. One in particular, comes from an unlikely team of people in an unlikely place. My name is Dennis Friest. I'm at Radcliffe, Iowa, Central Iowa. We have a family farm operation. We have about 1,450 acres of row crops and we farrow to finish about 4,500 pigs a year and we also finish an additional 5,000 feeder pigs a year. Iowa is blessed with some of the most productive soils in the world. Iowa's farmers produce 23 million acres of row crops, mostly corn and soybeans. Almost every acre is put to use, producing food and energy. Some people say, well, what does Iowa have to do with the Gulf of Mexico or the ocean anyway? And we say, well, about 200 million gallons every minute. The Mississippi River has a drainage from 31 states. What happens in Iowa, what happens in uh, Nebraska, in Idaho, in West Virginia, that happens to the ocean. There's an enormous impact. Once covered by tall grass prairie and roamed by millions of bison, the Midwest now is a highly modified landscape of industrial agriculture. This new monoculture of row crops releases great quantities of excess nutrients in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus that now washes from Midwestern soils by way of the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. Here, these nutrients create immense blooms of algae, whose decaying masses deplete the ocean water of oxygen, every year creating a dead zone the size of Massachusetts, a hypoxic zone that suffocates nearly everything in its path. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away, fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. As we start to figure out how to do a better job, we can lessen that amount of phosphorus that leaves our farms and lessen that amount of nitrogen that leaves our farms. It isn't easy to do as you look at that water wanting to carry those products, but it's something that we can do and been starting to improve, and I think we have some more that we can get done on that. To witness firsthand what it was they were hoping to save, 
a group of Iowa farmers, led by Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey, boarded a southbound bus and followed their Mississippi River downstream to its meeting with the Gulf of Mexico. I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't think I've had Iowa farmers on the boat. I've had just about everybody else from rock stars to country music singers to Oklahoma tourists, but no Iowa farmers. Taking the bait, but not taking the hooks. It won't go back. Wow. And you push it, and that's, his little, that's what they call a trigger fish. See how hard that dorsal fin is? You push that down, it, okay. it comes straight down. I'm basically a fish out of water down here, aren't I? <laughs> Interesting experience. I guess I didn't realize uh, the value of it as far as the, the fishing industry and that sort of thing, how important it is. We got folks out here looking at the water that uh, comes originally in some cases from way up north and realizing that we got a part in, in making sure we can do our part in keeping this water clean. Right, thank you. If someone had asked me a year or so ago if I would be working with the Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Iowa and, and taking him out on a boat this past weekend, I, I would have said no, I, there's no way that's going to be happening, but it is, and that's a good thing. Okay, are so you holding back here? Yes, sir, right here behind wow, us. They here. are sandy field. Got them? Rough Got field them. Yeah, yeah. It shows that people throughout the, this country uh, understand that we need to work together to solve problems that extend well beyond the boundaries of our state. Uh, the resources that we manage, our fish, our shrimp, they don't know where state lines are. The governors of the five states bordering the Gulf of Mexico came to realize that each of their economic futures hinged on the health of the same ecological system. Their agreement to preserve that system became the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Basically try to move from a, a system of state-by-state -state governance of, our, of the Gulf of Mexico to one on a more regional basis. And we've extended that partnership up into the watershed of the Mississippi River. And we focused on Iowa first because they were very proactive in their desire to work uh, with us to ultimately reduce nutrient input into the Mississippi River watershed and hopefully reduce or eliminate not only the dead zone that forms every summer off the Texas and Louisiana coast, but also to improve oxygen conditions throughout the Gulf. We're talking about not just doing things differently when you get on your tractor or in your pickup truck in Iowa. We're talking about thinking about things differently. I guess the catalyst that got me going on that was there was money available, funding available in this program that if I reduced my nitrogen 50 pounds the acre and I lost yield, they would reimburse me for the yield that I lost. So I had a, I had a no-lose situation. One of the farmers' innovative experiments is aiming to lighten their heavy reliance on fertilizer. The entrepreneurial Dennis Friest was one of the first farmers to take the leap, reducing his fertilizer dose substantially. And we weren't losing any yield. So it was really an eye-opener to say that we are being told by our retailers and industry that we need so much nitrogen to produce a bushel of corn. We're finding out that that was on the high side and that extra pounds we were putting out were actually going to waste and we're going ending up in the Gulf of Mexico in the hypoxia zone. Number one, it's about the environment, but number two, it's also about economics. We're not leaching that nutrient away. We use less to get more and we use less which makes the bottom line for us a lot better. It leaves dollars in our pockets. Iowa's commitment to reduce their total farmland runoff by 45% will take a larger effort than using less fertilizer. Much of Iowa's rain-fed cropland is engineered to drain water as fast as possible. 
water invariably laden with nitrogen and phosphorus, and headed for trouble in the Gulf. Those out to stop the flood of farmland runoff into the Mississippi are now building a series of enormous organic filters, otherwise known as wetlands. Right now we're developing what's called nutrient reduction wetlands. We've got about 70 of those on the ground now. And these wetlands are placed um, below a farming watershed and that water then sits in these wetlands for a short period of time. Those wetlands reduce the amount of nitrogen in that water. As that water leaves, it has 40 to 70 percent less nitrogen than it did as it came in. All of these sites are on private lands. It's been very popular in Iowa, and we actually have a two-year waiting list of landowners waiting to proceed with restorations of wetlands on their lands. The limitation is the availability of funding, both federal and state funding under the Farm Bill and state uh, funding sources. This area here, when it's fl flooded with water, will be, what, 27 to 37 acres, yeah. something like that. It's, it's got the pack. It'll be Father and son dairy farmers, Doug and Herman DeWall, are part of a growing cadre of Iowa farmers turned wetland ambassadors. It's going to take cooperation from a, from a number of people as well as, as state and federal help to get this off the ground because uh, uh, we, we've got to start someplace to get this going. It just, uh, we just can't go to work and start dumping water and have no uh, uh, responsibility or care about other people. We have to, everybody's here, we, and, we need to all work on this project. And there is some places where they may not be able to put one of these in, but maybe we can do a better job here and keep it back more so that the average will be down to where we need to be. To achieve a 45% reduction in nitrate will require all of the nitrate reduction practices that we currently have available implemented fully across these landscapes to the extent that they're practical, plus about 2,000 to 3,000 of these nitrogen removal wetlands. It turns out the farmer's workhorse wetlands are serving far higher purposes than mere water filters. Oh, there they are. That's a pair of trumpeter swans. They came into the area about three years ago, the first pair. They've raised several offspring uh, over the last three years. And the story was out that they might have been the first pair that nested outside of captivity in Boone County. And they've come back three years in a row. So I'm pretty proud of them. I've always thought that we got to do everything we can do to try to keep everything rolling and, and, and working, even if it's down in New Orleans. If it's our fault, we want to we wanna fix it. Lifelong Iowan Jim McHugh jumped at the opportunity to establish a wetland on his farm with a sense of stewardship reaching far beyond his property line. I think I'm doing my part to help clean up the Mississippi, and it's only a little part, but it's at least it's a part. Building on little contributions from lots of people, Iowa's farmland fixes have begun to evolve. From simple engineering solutions for nitrogen to an ecological integration of Iowa's native prairie. And some of the major grasses like Indian grass here. This is a, another one of the tall grass prairie species that really uh, is responsible for building organic matter that made our Iowa soils ideal for farming. The Iowa waters feeding the Mississippi were once filtered not only by native wetlands, but also by native tall grass prairie, a natural safeguard since jettisoned by Iowa's new monoculture ecology. 
So it has become a natural question for landscape ecologist Matt Helmers to ask if Tallgrass Prairie could once again protect the waters of the Mississippi. And one of the things is that people that walk their land, that understand uh, their land, they know where water flows and they know where they might need the most protection. And really then it's trying to get species that are, are diverse, uh, that maybe were, were native to that area, get those planted in that location to reducing that flow of water, um, the rate of flow and reducing some of the, the contaminants or nutrients that are in that water uh, before it flows downstream. Planting strips of native tall grass prairie is another promising method to fight the suffocating hypoxia more than a thousand miles away. This collaboration between Iowa State University and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service shows that these prairie strips provide significant local benefits as well. Keeping soil and nutrients on the farm while creating wildlife habitat. If these practices were adopted broadly, imagine the landscape with strips and borders and boundaries that include diverse prairie. And suddenly we have corridors built into the ag landscape for wildlife. We have uh, corridors that prevent water from being polluted unduly. The first test strips of integrating native prairie in between cornfields yielded astonishing results. Prairie strips can provide a level of benefits no one expected. So we saw about a 90 to 95 percent reduction in that first year in sediment loss and we saw about a 85 to 90 percent reduction in total nitrogen and total phosphorus loss with that surface runoff water. Fewer tons of fertilizer, more acres of wetlands and prairie. All are lightening Iowa's agricultural burden on the Gulf of Mexico without burdening the returns of Iowa's farmers. If you're interested in keeping your farm where the farm's supposed to be and not washing away, this is an excellent program and uh, I highly recommend it. If you like wildlife, if you're thinking about conservation, give it a thought, really give it a thought. He's a fighter. Got one, huh? Got a fish on coming here. He's a big one, I think. And the relationship we've formed with Iowa has engaged uh, some of the other Midwestern states, like Illinois, um, to come join us. So um, we're trying to use the model of the Gulf of Mexico Alliance to, to spread this concept of states working together toward achieving regional goals and objectives. We need a healthy marine environment, and we need resilient coastlines. Increasing water quality, decreasing nutrient introduction, um, increasing and, and restoring and improving habitat function, um, all of those things build toward a, a healthy marine environment. And they don't need to come at the cost of economic development. The important thing is that the ecosystem retains its resilience, its ability to survive. And that goes also for the people who live along the coasts. Uh, we want resilient um, communities. We want communities that can withstand floods, withstand hurricanes, withstand other threats that, that may occur and, and still survive. And so if our, if our human communities, if our animal communities you know, can be resilient, uh, that, that's the most important thing. If we can carry out the plans that we have put in place now, we will achieve those goals. And 20, 25 years from now, we'll, we'll be able to look back and say, boy, we really did a good thing. 